This is Chris Osborne from Play Comics, and you are listening to Genuine Chit Chat. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Be sure to check out Play Comics if you're interested in video games and comic books. Uh, I've included a link in the description. Anyway, hello guys, and welcome to another episode of Genuine Chit Chat. This week, I'm chatting with Magnus Unimer. Now, I've wanted to speak to someone about artificial intelligence um, for quite a while now, and Magnus fits that description perfectly, because he's a marketing, automation, and artificial intelligence consultant. He's also an author who has written several books, including one specifically about artificial intelligence's role in sort of data analysis and marketing. Now, due to Magnus's unique knowledge in the matter, um, I asked him a lot of questions surrounding these sort of general questions about AI, um, obviously including the main ones of, you know, what's the future of AI, what are some of the issues that may come along with it, you know, legal and ethical implications with it. Um, I asked him about how intelligent AI currently is at the moment and which countries are kind of leading in artificial intelligence, to his knowledge at least. We also discuss a term which is what is the Internet of Things, um, which is quite an interesting subject matter about sort of computers or rather sort of like washing machines, electronic items connecting to the Internet and being able to sort of order things for themselves. Um, we also talk about Amazon's potential plans for world domination, which is incredibly interesting, as well as how Magnus stays motivated, um, some of his methods when it comes to writing, why he wrote a book, if he'd actually want to live forever, if that was a possibility, as well as many other interesting things. So it's very much an artificial intelligence intelligence heavy conversation so if that's the kind of thing that interests you this is going to be a fantastic chat now there's no promo today um so we're just going to get straight into the show um so thanks as always for tuning in guys be sure to like and subscribe in all the usual places share on social media and all that jazz and i'll be back at the end to talk about what's coming up anyway thanks guys and i hope you enjoy the chat Welcome to Genuine Chit Chat, where we have honest conversations with interesting people. And I'm your host, Mike Burton. I am joined today uh, by Magnus. Uh, Magnus, you are uh, well, probably a lot more intelligent than I am, and that is not a stretch of the imagination. That is, the amount of work that you've done in not only data marketing and artificial intelligence is astounding um you've also written several books um you're a public speaker and to top it all off as well you are swedish and you're going to be speaking in english today which just shows even further of <laughs> how much more intelligent you are so uh, say hello to uh, all our audiences and uh, just a general overview of who you are and what you get up to really hello and thank you very much for inviting me to the show as well so uh, my name is uh, magnus junemeyer i'm swedish and i live in sweden um, I have been working pretty much my entire life uh, in the international software industry and more specifically in the uh, microprocessor semiconductor chip industry. So I have a fairly technical background, although I have been for the last 20 years or so in the marketing side of things. And uh, actually the last 15 years I was the co-founder and co-owner of a company in the uh, Internet of Things space uh, where I kind of built a distributor network around the globe and uh, was running the marketing uh, department, uh, although for very technical products and in a very, very technical industry. Uh, So that is pretty much my background, I think. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, May I ask, um, how did you sort of get into uh, essentially the the job that you're in now? Obviously, artificial intelligence and especially with data marketing and things, that's quite a a new enterprise, uh, I assume, primarily driven by the internet. Um, So when did you sort of when did you kind of get started in this? Was it from the get go as soon as you finished college or university or how, how did you kind of get into this line of work? So when I left university um, in the early 1990s, I don't think internet was actually used for marketing uh, at all at the time. So I was uh, fairly early out uh, on the internet, but uh, uh, the first decade or so, uh, marketing pretty much meant old style marketing with you know trade exhibitions and uh, printed uh, brochures and stuff like that. But I have been uh, in the software industry for over 20 years and I have a very strong technical interest or interest in software or, and software development. Uh, I also was very interested in marketing. So I had one leg in the software side of things and the other leg in the marketing side of things. And I think the perfect combination of the two is something called marketing automation, which is when we use software tools to drive internet marketing in clever ways. 
Hmm. And the natural progression of marketing automation is to create uh, autonomous uh, and data-driven marketing systems that are powered by AI. So after (laughs) running internet marketing for some time and then specializing in marketing automation, then I found it interesting to pursue that direction to even more technically advanced marketing and then that became AI powered marketing automation. That's that's amazing. I mean, yeah, I mean, you really obviously got in the door at the right time. I mean, the technological revolution, it's just exploded. I mean, the internet, obviously, I'm quite young, so me saying this sounds very stupid, but it is it's amazing how as you say, like going back to just the 90s, like uh, less than 30 years ago, and the internet was barely even a pipe dream. And, and now it's so huge in the Western world, one can almost not imagine that it's not going to be, it's not there. Like you can't even imagine a world without it. Um, so linking in with that, um, I, I've heard generally of sort of data marketing and things, but with the audience, I'd say with a general uh, description of it, is it sort of the way, so let's use Facebook as an example, where Facebook adverts kind of attune to your likes and things and what you've kind of been viewing online. Is that a general idea of one of the sort of uh, types? I think so. Uh, but one could also position it in a, in a negative way or in a positive way. And I think that data-driven marketing or, or AI-driven uh, you know, decision-making uh based on AI insights in the sense of Cambridge Analytica, where we interfere in public elections and stuff is quite scary and mm-hmm. perhaps have a slightly negative or even very negative side, uh, you know, feeling to it. Uh, but the same kind of technology can be used quite positively also. So we can track what people are doing on the website, whether or not they open certain emails or how long time they watch a video clip on the website, for example. And all that data can go into um, an algorithm that works out what kind of content you are most likely interested to consume or also what kind of products you are most likely to to be interested in purchasing. And therefore, we can actually create websites that have much more interesting uh, information uh, for uh, every particular Visitor. So the website can actually adapt its content dependent on who visits it, uh, offering our kind of, uh, of uh, you know, text and imagery, for example. Uh, and when you come to a to an uh, e-commerce shop, for example, you can uh, promote the kind of stuff that you most likely are interested in. And the advantage with this is that we can spam people with less uh, information they don't really want to hear about and we can become much more engaging and uh, you know provide a better customer experience and uh, appear more delightful in our communication let's say by sending less irrelevant stuff Mm, yeah and that's one thing that a lot of people kind of with marketing in general and advertising especially a lot of people find it irritating in a lot of ways understandably because no one no one kind of wants to be advertised to but everyone Mm -hmm who has any stake in any kind of business is an advertiser you know i've got i've got friends who are podcasters and they use podcasting as adverts you know they they put themselves out there they promote their show that that is advertising they use people who use hashtags on facebook uh, on uh, instagram rather and twitter that is a way of almost advertising to people because it's people are searching for this thing and you're like well they're my things linked to that thing there's not a specific vetting process when it comes to hashtags and social media so one thing with people that I find is they don't appreciate how attuned marketing would be so much better. Because as you say, you know, there's so many people who've had it where they get constant emails about things they just do not want, you know. And I find it a lot more satisfying if a lot of the emails I get are things trying to get me to buy things. If it's something I'd be interested in, you know, you open up the email, you read it, you go, oh, that's actually really cool. Maybe a friend of mine will want that or maybe I want it another time. But now it's just like, I can't quite afford that or something like that. Whereas just having loads of random things shot at you is, as you say, pointless. And it becomes it becomes an overload in a sense. So it, with that in mind, where do you think this is going in a sense? I know that's quite a huge question, um, but I, generally speaking, I, I want to add into there, I noticed about sort of machines being like ordering their own things. I know that you are quite attuned to that sort of thing. So I wondered about that. So assuming we still uh, discuss uh, marketing, uh, I think that we will see uh, certainly a lot more autonomous uh, marketing systems whereby human beings are not really in charge of 
decisions uh, in relation to what information we send to who at what time with what content. Uh, that will mean that we will get more relevant information at the right time, uh, which is probably quite good for most of us who don't like receiving spam. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we will see a world where the marketing decisions are becoming increasingly data-driven. So we will base uh, decisions on facts rather than gut feeling. So again, helping us to send less spammy emails and appear more relevant with the right content at the right time to the right person. But so far, uh, AI-driven insights or data-driven marketing based on AI have been based on insights around how people behave, so potential customers or actual paying customers. So we can see how people click around on the website or what purchase patterns they they have in the web shop, for example. <clears throat> but I think that the next thing after AI is becoming commonplace. So in the sense, AI based on human generated data. Uh, the next thing thereafter will be AI decisions being <coughs> made from data that comes from machines. So we, have, we will have a lot of internet connected machines, uh, probably something like one trillion IoT devices, internet connected devices within five to six years. And these, uh, <clears throat> these machines will generate an enormous amount of data about how they operate and how they are being used. And if we apply AI algorithms to harvest that data for insights, then uh, we can actually drive marketing uh, uh, decisions autonomously or, or automatically from machine-generated data. So just to take one example, uh, assuming we have a windmill and we equip the windmill with a heat and vibration sensor, then uh, if we monitor the heat and vibrations every second, uh, we can use AI technologies to detect that this particular windmill will likely break down in two weeks' time because other windmills that experience the same kind of heat and vibration patterns did in fact break down two weeks later. So we can actually predict that a machine is about to break down two weeks later on, and therefore we can send service uh, technicians or spare parts uh, in time to prevent the machine from breaking down in the first place. And I think in this kind of sense, we will move from human-generated data that triggers marketing decisions to machine-generated data that will trigger marketing campaigns or marketing activities in completely autonomous software systems. Mm, that's that's incredible. I mean, that's something that a lot of people would hear and are probably quite skeptical about in the sense of obviously there's the idea of machines making machines or machines communicating with machines without uh, human intervention. There's a lot of things that people sort of worry about in that in that sense, isn't there? Where there's so many sci-fi movies about you know the robots taking over and things, and, and then there's a lot of individuals who are worried about artificial intelligence and things. And I, I wanted to ask. Um, there's there's a few different types of uh, intelligence. I knew vaguely uh, what they were, but I had to look them up to get these specific uh, phrasings right. There's narrow, general, and super intelligence. And from what I understand, narrow is like Siri on your iPhone. General is kind of like human level intelligence. And then super intelligence is obviously just incredibly far beyond that. What, in your opinion, where are we at now with that sort of level of artificial intelligence? And are you, just as an individual do you have any concerns about not only the, the robots taking over, but also people's jobs and things slowly being taken over by automation? So many questions in one. I do, apo <laughs> I do apologize. Let's, uh, so let's start uh, with the first one. So we don't really have artificial intelligence. What we have is pretty much machine, machine learning or predictive analytics, which are data-driven ways to predict the future of uh, someone's behavior or of something. Um, we do have, we, we could say that we do have uh, narrow AI, which is pretty much machine learning. And narrow AI are computer systems that can predict the future behavior of something or someone um, in the sense that they do it for a purpose to which they are pre programmed. So we can create, for example, a narrow AI system or a narrow uh, machine learning system that can predict at what time of the day a particular person should receive an email to increase the uh, chance that that person opens it. 
that system, even though we could say that it is AI or, or machine learning, cannot do other things. It could not, for example, start to predict when the windmill will break down because it isn't pre-programmed to do that different task. So narrow AI or machine learning will not be very dangerous uh, from that point of view. It will not take over the world. Uh, and then we have something that appears a little bit more intelligent, for example, the Siri uh, voice uh, assistant in the iPhones or the, the uh, Google and uh, Amazon equivalents with the smart speakers, for example. And I would argue that they are also narrow AI. It's just more advanced versions of it. They can't really start to do things that they haven't been programmed to do. So uh, real uh, general AI or strong AI is something we don't really have yet. And, uh, well, super intelligence then would be far further down the road. But one of the uh, biggest uh, futurists in the world is, uh, is a guy called Ray Kurzweil. And he uh, predicts that by 2045, uh, AI robots will be more intelligent than the most intelligent human being on the planet. And uh, since we will use AI to develop even smarter AI software, uh, the intelligence gap between humans and AI will very, very quickly uh, increase. Uh, and in fact, uh, probably AI robots will increase their intelligence over humans at an exponential rate. So, uh, you know, by 2045 or, you know, somewhere around that time, we may be in a situation where the AI software solutions actually are very, very clever or at least appears to be very clever. I don't think we can talk about true intelligence, but very, very clever uh, software systems that base their predictions and decisions on huge amounts of data that uh, creates the decision-making decision that are actually fact-based rather than gut feeling. Mm, I see. I mean, one of the things I've, uh, in regards to sort of the AI learning at such a ridiculous rate, one example I've heard is essentially with yourself and me, for example, us talking between me saying something and you saying something, your, your brain has, you know, a few seconds or so once the sentence is finished to kind of think of what to say. And then, you know, as you're saying things, you're thinking of sort of the next thing to say generally. Um, and one mm -hmm. thing, obviously, if you have an argument with someone, it's that same sort of few seconds or so. But with artificial intelligence, one of the uh, things people have said about it is the processors and the ways within it that work are going to be so superior to humans it will almost be like a minute to us for a uh, really super intelligent um, ai system they could have like thousands of years the equivalent of that and the idea to kind of for people who aren't as in tune with ai and things like that to kind of uh, describe it really basically and vaguely is almost like after every conversation having 10,000 years to make an answer and in that space of time you'd have so, you'd go through so many options and you'd have so many things to think about that it's incomprehensible by human standards we just do not have the processing power for that and so one of obviously the issues with people is we're also very flawed and as you say people with gut feelings or emotions you know people let things get in the way but but with these artificial intelligence systems they could be they could use ways that humans haven't even conceived of now that could obviously bring its own set of problems uh, for example jobs there's you know people like yourself for example who you develop uh, ai and things like that is there any in your opinion do you think there's any fear of people losing their jobs including yourself or do you think humans will always have a sort of a way in it it's a tough question i would probably say that there is a very big risk of ai taking many jobs and it uh, well it will happen um but it may also be that new jobs will be created job descriptions we are don't know about yet. So um, only 20 years ago, no one knew anything about you know, WordPress administrators or search engine optimization consultants or, <laughs> or, or conversion ratio optimization consultants and stuff. And, and that is, is job descriptions that were unheard of 20 years ago. And perhaps we will see the same kind of progression whereby new jobs are created that we can't really uh, comprehend at this point in time. And uh, let's hope that because uh, AI will take many jobs and it will take particularly jobs that has to do with uh, numerical analysis or data analysis. These are the jobs that will go first, I think. So if you have any kind of job whereby you study uh, numbers and you know draw conclusions from, from uh, data, then, then you will probably be replaced by AI robots quite soon. That includes uh, stock market analysts or, uh, you know, 
bookkeepers for financial records or, or uh, stuff like that. Even um, lawyers are, are at a high risk of being replaced because there are now several AI robots that are designed to, to study legal agreements and legal documents automatically and point out any legal flaws in them, for example. So any kind of work that has to do with numerical or, or data analysis, let's say, will be replaced. Um, and the same will go for any kind of repetitive work, I think, will be automated by AI. The kind of jobs that will stay is uh, any type of job that benefits from a human connection, so taking care of elderly, uh, for example. Uh, restaurant uh, servants, for example, where you actually want someone to come and you know be very nice and serve the food. Uh, tourist guides, perhaps. Um, but I think that any kind of job that has to do with you know data analysis and decision making from data analysis will go away quickly. Even very superior jobs and very high paid and well educated jobs will go away. I see. Yeah. And that's a very good point. I mean, I hadn't fully considered the sort of care jobs and things. Obviously, one big fear among a lot of people, especially I think in America, it's especially a big fear, are self-driving cars. And then that potentially, um, you know, taking Ubers and taxis out of the equation, as well as like haulage drivers and delivery drivers and things. And obviously Amazon are already talking about or starting to use drones and things. So it's even more <laughs> crazy and stuff. Um, but mm. keeping in that same sort of uh, line, who, which countries are, to your knowledge, at least leading on the sort of um, AI front, or which countries are utilizing sort of the artificial intelligence that you are a specialist in? So I would say that the vast majority of AI companies, at least in, in my industry, are uh, from the US. Um, Israel seems to be uh, quite good at AI, considering the fairly small population of their country. Um, in terms of large-scale government use of AI, I would probably say that China is, is uh, well ahead and uh, they kind of monitor the behaviors of all their citizens already with uh, you know, a lot of AI algorithms that uh, monitor how people walk on the streets with face recognition or uh, analyze uh, what you tweet on Twitter or uh, you know, if you have any speeding penalties or stuff that can can mean that you, for example, will not be uh, entitled to visit the hospital or you may not be allowed to buy an airplane ticket, for example. They call that the social scoring system and it's uh, it's uh, becoming deployed now in China and they actually use AI to, to monitor the behaviors and score the behaviors of all the citizens in the entire country. And uh, if you don't score well enough or you do bad things uh, in their eyes, then, then you may be banned from visiting the hospital, for example. Oh, that's wow. quite scary. Mm. That is scary. Do you think anything like that uh, may potentially move over to the Western world around sort of Europe or the US? I think London have had over a million video cameras for, for a decade, with face recognition already. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, there is a lot of things that can be done. And I think that perhaps some of the Western countries have a little bit uh, more uh, legal controls put in place to, to prevent the government from doing too much spying on the citizens perhaps but uh, the technology is here it will not go away and sooner or later some of it will be used for purposes that perhaps may not be so positive yeah i see um and also um you mentioned slightly earlier on in the uh, chat and i forgot to uh, bring up was um the term the internet of things um mm -hmm. now for any uh, listeners i'm familiar with that what specifically is the the internet of things essentially so the internet of things is basically uh, products being hooked up to the internet. So any kind of industrial machinery, any kind of uh, personal gadget you're wearing, uh, like the iPhone, uh, but it can be uh, stuff in your home, like the uh, fridge, the microwave oven, the bur burglar alarm, uh, the thermostat, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. But it can be also be uh, individual light bulbs that you can switch on or switch off for change the coloring of the light bulb from from some remote location, for example, the iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly uh, millions and millions of industrial sensors and industrial machinery. Uh, even uh, bridges, uh, farmers' fields and livestock is now connected to the internet, in fact. So it will mm. come pretty much everywhere. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, as you mentioned, did thermostats and things. I mean, so many more gadgets are being utilized by smartphones and things. Everything is just going to be connected by that. And it's going to be very interesting to see how humans 
evolve with it not necessarily in a, in a physical sense because obviously that takes you know hundreds of thousands if not millions of years but in a in a social sense like um how people are sort of adjusting to ai as well as being able to interact with things obviously the uh, internet of things um so one of the things i was going to ask you about as well was you you've written five books and that's no small feat in any uh, stretch of the imagination. But these ones obviously very uh, data heavy. I believe one of them was about ebooks, and I know the most recent one is data driven marketing with artificial intelligence. So, may I ask you, sort of, what inspired you to write your your first book, and then also why did you want to write your latest one? So I think that I have always been interested in books, even as a teenager, or even uh, before my teenage years. I was reading loads and loads of books. I remember even trying to to write a, a detective story when I was 10 years old, and I think I only got around to maybe 25 pages or so. <laughs> but I've always been interested in reading a lot and uh, you know, also writing a book. And I, I think that the first book was kind of on my bucket list. It was something I had to do once in my life. Uh, but then I realized it wasn't really all that hard. Uh, so I, I wrote a couple of more books, and then... At the time of of uh, starting the project with my last book, the, the um, uh, data driven marketing with artificial intelligence, I just found it the right time. Uh, there are thousands, or if not tens of thousands, of books on marketing, for example, or any subject you can imagine. There are thousands of books, but uh, marketing with artificial intelligence really didn't have a lot of books. I think it was like five books worldwide, uh, at least in English. Uh, written uh, about marketing with AI. So I found it a really, really good marketing opportunity. And uh, marketing with AI is kind of cross-domain, which is fairly hard to to to, um, to cover for people without the right background. So there are many people who knows everything about AI. And there are many people that knows everything about marketing, but there is not very many people that knows both AI and marketing, uh, thus being capable of writing a book on that topic. So I, I took the chance and wrote it because, you know, it will not happen in, in a year or two that there are only five books on that subject. So it was a good um, you know, point in time to write the book. Mm, that's a good show. And, and just for my own interest, what, what was your sort of process of writing a book? Like how, how long does it generally sort of uh, take you to, to write a book? It usually takes me uh, three to nine months, dependent on how much I know about the subject in advance how uh, many pages the book will contain and how much research I have to do. So the data-driven marketing of artificial intelligence required quite a bit of, of uh, research. Um, and it took nine months, pretty much two hours every day. And uh, there's only one thing that is hard with writing a book. Uh, anyone can write a book. It's not, not difficult, really. The, the only thing which is really hard is to turn up every day and do the one or two hours every, every day. So the consistency is the key. And uh, as long as you can, you know, keep consistently working one or two hours every day and keep doing that every day, then everyone can write a book because the actual writing is not really hard. I see. And have you got any, you don't have to spoil what they're going to be about, but have you got other books in the pipeline that you're planning on releasing in the coming years? Um, actually not, because I was quite tired after writing the, the, the last book. So I, I don't really have any plans for any books near term now, but you know, who knows? What about, what about any fiction books you mentioned about your uh, detective novel? Are you going to delve into the world of sci-fi or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, maybe. We will see. But uh, no, uh, no plans uh, currently. Okay. And um, just for the listeners as well, what... Um, Specifically, when you go around and you speak with people and you have these sort of talks uh, with individuals and also with businesses, what is it that you're um, speaking about? Is it uh, specifically the data marketing and the artificial intelligence stuff at the moment, or is there sort of a, a wider berth of things uh, discussed? So in the past 10, 20 years, I was in the Internet of Things industry or the microprocessor chip industry. So I did talk mostly about the technology side of things, so how to develop Internet of Things products, basically. Um, nowadays, I am more a marketing consultant. So nowadays, I usually talk about uh, marketing with artificial intelligence because it's such a hot topic right now and there isn't really too many people that can talk about it because we don't have a you know, suitable background to it. So currently, mostly marketing with AI. 
Okay, that fair enough. And um, regarding sort of how obviously writing five books, and also um, I saw on your site you essentially you travel around quite a lot, and you well, essentially motivate and inform people. How do you, as an individual, keep yourself motivated? Like, is there a sort of key that you use, or, or is it just you know what you want to get done, and you just kind of go do it? I think I'm quite good at at uh, being consistently doing the work required. So uh, that is, I think, the major uh, reason for for the success. Uh, But I'm very, very interested in technology. And uh, even when I work with marketing, I do it with a very strongly technical touch, let's say. So uh, I'm very interested in learning new things. And uh, I think the eagerness of learning new new interesting stuff is, is what drives me. Out of interest, um, what are some of your personal uh, interests? What sort of things is you as an individual, as Magnus, do you just love finding out about? So I like very much traveling uh, in exotic countries if I can. So Southeast Asia is my favorite. So Indonesia or Laos or Vietnam, for example, or, or even Thailand. Um, but I, uh, on a, a smaller scale, I like very much cooking. So I watch all the cooking shows on TV and uh, I like to spend a couple of hours in the evening cooked uh, <clears throat> meals um, the tweet at home as well so i think uh, cooking is is one of my uh, big interests oh well that's maybe you could write a cookbook then <laughs> you've already got yeah, the other maybe, five yeah. uh, i'm not so, such a good cook unfortunately so <laughs> i'm sure you're the far better I, than I am. the fact that i like cooking doesn't mean i'm good at it <laughs> i get, i wish i was a uh, good at cooking i'm i'm just not at all but um uh, just quickly back to traveling just out of interest uh, what is it about because um, I've, I've got a few friends who've traveled around asia and things and i personally haven't actually been outside of europe I, i've been to a fair few places inside europe but i haven't uh, gone out yet what is it about asia that you like so much is it sort of the cultural change and things or is there just a uh, something else so I think there is a combination of many things. Uh, one is the climate, of course. Uh, it's always warm and nice. You can wear shorts and flip-flops uh, on the beach, which is usually not the case in Sweden. <clears throat> um, I also like the, the uh, tropical green scenery. So I find the uh, green jungles very, very nice and scenic, along with the uh, coral reefs and the blue, blue uh, you know, water. I like the food a lot, especially Thai food is is fantastic, I think. Uh, but also the people are are very friendly. Uh, and uh, generally, Southeast Asia is very safe. So, uh, and it's also quite cheap uh, compared to going, for example, to America on holiday. It's it's an awful lot cheaper to go to Vietnam or you know, even Thailand. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And um, obviously with your... It's, it's line- a combina- combination of things. Yeah, that's cool. And obviously, with your line of work, you've um, you've travelled around uh, a lot of different countries. So, um, so some of the countries you've done talks at, obviously, I know America is one of the big ones, but I assume you've travelled around Europe quite a lot, and you've been to quite a few of the uh, Asian countries as well for your work. Mm, yeah, so Japan, Taiwan, Korea, for example, yes. Hmm, I see. Oh, that's interesting. And um, one thing I noticed as well on your uh, on your blog was uh, quite an interesting piece that I want to flag up with you because I'm intrigued by it. Is um, Amazon's world domination? And uh, I <laughs> yeah. saw about that. I'd like to you to just uh, elaborate mm. a small amount more on that, if possible. Mm. So uh, <clears throat> I would say, uh, at least in Sweden, but I think everywhere, uh, there is quite a big concern about Amazon becoming quite dominant. And <clears throat> I believe that uh, in the US, uh, I think Amazon have 50% of the US e-commerce business or something like that. Oh, wow. apparently, apparently, they have 70% of the growth of e-commerce. So it's actually getting larger uh, by every year. So there's a lot of concern in the e-commerce industry that uh, you know Amazon is killing all the other options. And we don't really have uh, Amazon in Sweden yet, but the e-commerce industry here is, is very concerned already, even before they are here, what will happen once they you know, establish themselves here and, and uh, yeah, try to kill all the other e-commerce alternatives with lower, lower prices, basically. Um, but uh, I think uh, it's quite interesting to notice that Amazon have bought uh, a piece of software that is used to develop Internet of Things products. It's actually an English uh, operating system called uh, Free Autos. And uh, <clears throat> that piece of software is used in roughly 20% of all Internet of Things devices being developed. And uh, it has been estimated there will be one trillion internet connected devices by 2025. And if they have 20% uh, 
uh, of that market that would mean that 200 billion machines will be equipped with the uh, operating system that Amazon controls. Now, it's not hard to believe that Amazon will extend that piece of software to make it possible for internet-connected devices to start to make autonomous purchases on the Amazon Web Shop. And if that happens, then the potential customer base for the Amazon Web Shop extends from some 10 billion people on the planet to perhaps 200 billion machines that would potentially be able to start to order things automatically or programmatically from the Amazon Web Shop. So, for example, coffee machines or or uh, you know washing machines and uh, stuff like that could you know automatically order new coffee beans or order new detergent whenever the machine determines it's about time to order new new coffee beans and um, you know imagine yourself selling a competing brand of coffee beans how would you market your coffee beans to a machine that is pre-programmed to go, to buy a competing brand somewhere else well you you can't <laughs> so um, i think that is uh, quite interesting uh, to see what will happen with, with amazon and their fairly large domination in terms of software for iot development uh, because most people haven't really connected with dot and dots and uh, started to realize that uh, what Amazon is actually doing is to position themselves into getting a monopoly whereby the vast majority of internet connected products may may be able to start to purchase things automatically from the web shop of, of Amazon. I see. Yeah, that I mean, that is a huge fear. I mean, Amazon, as you've already stated, you know, it's it's already such a huge thing. And I mean, there's people I know who don't shop anywhere apart from Amazon. So you know, and that's actually having choice. Uh, I can go. I'm not going to go into the the uh, sort of discussion about choice and free will and things. If we just say for now that uh, humans do have choice and everything. So many people already choose Amazon, and that's not having anything built in with them. And so having machines with that sort of software already in them is a, a very scary enterprise. And building off that sort of thing with um, Amazon's own softwares and things, it sounds like a quite a vague and large question, and I do apologize. But like, how does one create AI technologies? How, how do you sort of, obviously a lot of your line of work is teaching people about the sort of the marketing and things, but am I right in thinking that yourself, you or uh, companies you're a part of have helped develop such technologies? Yeah, so I think you can use AI in two different ways if you're a company and you want to, you know, leverage AI in your business. So one road would be to hire some mathematician or data scientist and uh, write your own AI software from scratch using a software development team, uh, which then needs product managers and stuff. And that is uh, certainly doable, and that is what uh, many companies are doing. Um, but it's fairly costly, and uh, it may be quite difficult to find the data scientists to do it because they are in in demand, and uh, they aren't really <laughs> too many of them in the world at this point in time. So I think most companies would uh, rely on ready-made AI technologies offered by you know, AI technology suppliers like Google or like Microsoft or like Amazon or like smaller, more specialized companies. And you would uh, create a uh, software solution uh, that can make predictions uh, using AI technologies by, by just building some fairly small or thin application on top of fairly large AI solutions someone else have created for you. Okay, then. Well, we're getting um, near the hour mark, so I'll start to wrap up around here soon. Um, but I want to ask sort of the are there any ethical implications that you can think of uh, regarding artificial intelligence? Uh, not just Skynet things, but people obviously having issues with AI data mining and things. Are there are those concerns things that are in the market and brought up quite frequently? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, is, is a clear, clear example of that, whereby mm. they apparently, uh, you know, uh, changed the outcome, perhaps of both the Brexit election as well as the Donald Trump presidential election, just by <laughs> analyzing how people behaved on Facebook and working out which kind of marketing message to send to each individual person in different demographics. So that is certainly a concern. Um, but even on a smaller scale, uh, there is. Uh, an American uh, retail chain that apparently employed some AI technologies to predict who was uh, pregnant based on uh, purchase patterns in the shop. So certain women would uh, buy a different pattern of groceries because they were uh, pregnant. 
and they used those predictions to send marketing uh, literature home to to those women, uh, you know, targeting the, the pregnant women. So it uh, happened that a teenage girl uh, exposed that purchase pattern in the shop, and so they would actually send uh, that girl, uh, you know, ads for uh, for pregnant women. The only thing was that the girl was actually still living at home with a uh, father and uh, mother at home, and the father opened the email and uh, sorry, the, the physical mail and uh, actually read the. The advertisements for uh, for pregnant women, and uh, he got really furious because obviously the teenage daughter wasn't pregnant. So he, uh, you know, called called the uh, shop, and uh, you know was very unhappy with them. But uh, it turned out that uh, she actually was pregnant, and he had to apologize, apologize to the shop. Uh, and uh, so, so in this particular case, it turned out that the shop could detect that the woman was um, pregnant. Uh, even though uh, perhaps her family didn't even know it, and they would send really well-targeted information. And and while the prediction uh, wasn't wrong, she was in fact pregnant. The consequences of of the shop sending sensitive marketing information to home to her parents was was perhaps not really ethical. So there are probably millions and millions of, of similar or different kinds of examples whereby AI can have moral or ethical consequences for sure. Mm, and there's one that um, comes to mind, which is, you know, if someone starts to put on weight and things, then if you had AI organizing what you buy and what you shop, then there's mm. con- there's people who have issues over, you know, potentially things coming in and ordering things for you that are the lighter version of this and the lighter version of that. And it becomes an interesting uh, sort of topic when one tries to work out how much one wants their own privacy and how much one wants their life improved in a sense. Have you, you go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so I think it can be even worse. Uh, imagine you have the Apple Watch that measures your you know, heart rate and stuff and you have an internet connected bathroom scale that measures your weight and combines medical information from a number of sensors and perhaps combine that with your purchase patterns of groceries and stuff. And then uh, perhaps uh, a company could could uh, conclude that based on your health sensors and your you know, eating and drinking patterns, we believe that you are quite likely going to get a heart attack or you know get cancer or something soon. So therefore, uh, as a uh, insurance company, we will deny you the possibility to to buy an insurance because we think that you will you know, die so. Mm. And that could perhaps be concluded by AI analytics of, of raw data that itself doesn't necessarily say that someone is going to die, but the combination of, of, of data sources combined with some AI algorithm perhaps can predict that to a high accuracy and therefore you will not even be allowed to to buy an insurance Mm. and that is quite scary that is definitely scary and obviously as you said certainly early in this conversation the trillion amount of um, devices that are going to be connected to the internet and things and um, all the sort of uh, the acceleration of what's going to happen over time do you think there's any way that people could actually avoid it or would want to avoid it even or do you think this is just something that's going to happen may it's likely going to be 25 years but even if people delay it heavily it's it's just inevitable of this all happening i think it will happen it will perhaps be controlled a little bit more in the future so we can see the gdpr in europe to be to be one uh, first step in that direction um but Technology has never ever been, you know, reversed uh, at any point in time in history. I think so. We will have to get used to it. I think, um, but also, I think we will have a little bit more legislation coming into force. But on the other hand, if we get really bad, bad uh, politicians, uh, you know, who knows what happens in ten or fifty years down the road. Mm, that's it um, and I think I've only got one more question for you which is slightly off topic but it's just a personal question of mine that I want to ask you uh, it sounds quite strange mm-hmm. but would you uh, get integrated with AI given the choice for example some sort of chip in your brain to connect to the internet instantaneously or or anything like that or do you are you more cautious on that side of things I think that the answer will differ from what day you ask me that question. Sometimes <laughs> I'm very pro technology, and sometimes I'm getting a little bit more careful. Uh, 
I, I think that you probably want it because it will give you such health benefits. It will help detect and avoid cancer or you know heart attack or other dangerous things. So it will probably come with benefits you would like. But it is also quite scary that the government or companies know everything about you. For example, the insurance companies I mentioned before. Hmm. But probably... 20 or 50 years down the road, uh, you will not be able to opt out of this data control society because uh, if you do, that will by itself be suspicious and perhaps even illegal. So now you can move off a grid and move to a hut in the forest and uh, disconnect from the mobile phone and the internet. But uh, perhaps you can't in 25 or 50 years because that would be suspicious in its own right to do so. Mm, I see. Um, that was going to be the last question. I just thought of one other one quickly. Well, um, then it will be. Uh, you've been very generous with your time, and I do appreciate it muchly. Um, would you, if you could, would you live forever? Um, which is quite a big open question. And you know, when I say forever, I mean as long as you possibly could, because say, well, the technology gets so good that we can somehow put consciousness into either a shell or something along those lines. I'm not being too specific with those details, but would you, Magnus, as an individual, want to live forever? Or do you think sort of mortality is kind of what makes life so special? It's, it's a quite big question. and I, I really do apologize. <laughs> given it uh, such a big thought, but I, I think that probably I would not like to live forever because it would be dead boring after <laughs> 1,000 years. I've already done everything 10 times. Um, so probably no. And the planet wouldn't survive if everyone did that because we would be overcrowded to, to a level that would not be possible for the planet to sustain, I think. But but uh, e even ignoring that, I think that uh, forever is, is a very long time. So mm. probably not. Uh, a longer time for sure, but uh, mm -hmm. forever, I'm not so sure. Mm, I see. I think that's um, just about everything. Uh, just before we head off then, um, is there anything else that you'd like to add and uh, also where people can sort of find your work and uh, things? So most of the information uh, related to me is available on my website, which would be unemeyer.com, where you can find my books and my courses and my blog for sure. Um, and I think that uh, generally I would just recommend people to be uh, you know, interested to learn more and uh, catch up with what is happening. Uh, uh, with the more knowledge uh, available, I think that we will have a better society. Well, that's a, that's an absolutely great way to end it. And I'll I'll make sure I include all the links to um, your website and all the sort of usual stuff as well. And once again, Magnus, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I really thank you. And thank you for inviting me again. <laughs> no problem at all. And that's the end of the podcast. Thanks as always for tuning in, guys. Um, coming up, I believe for the month of April, um, I will only be releasing two episodes of the podcast, but I'll be they're quite long chats, so I'll be splitting them in two. So what I believe I'm going to be doing is doing part one and two of my chat with Frank Burton, who's been a guest on the podcast previously and hosts the Ragbag podcast, which is also part of the Britpod scene, um, and then. I'll be releasing the chat with Beth Crane of We Fix Space Junk. Um, obviously, there's the two-parter that I did with Headley Knights. Um, both Headley Knights and Beth Crane basically work together and do We Fix Space Junk. So if you're a fan of that audio drama, which you should be because it's amazing, um, then those two podcasts go hand in hand. The Headley one, I think, was released uh, November sort of time last year. Um, after that, I've got a couple of other podcasts in the pipeline. I think apart from my trip to Amsterdam in the second week of April I think I've got a podcast chat planned every week of April and of May um, a lot of them are going to be sort of guests over Skype but I'm hoping to do another science but simple um, I'm hoping to do a chat with my friend Dan and there's a friend of mine who's a fellow podcaster who I chat with uh, semi-regularly which I'm hoping I'll be able to chat with him as well so quite a few guests some are podcasters some people I know some are just a bit of a mix so I think the coming weeks is going to be very interesting not only for the chats I'm already releasing but the ones I'll be recording Obviously, as I'll be going to Amsterdam in the second week of April, I would encourage anyone who's interested in seeing what I get up to to go over to my Instagram page, or my the podcast, however you want to phrase it, um, at genuine underscore chit chat. 
the links to, should be in the description to all my episodes of you know links to facebook instagram and twitter uh, facebook i do a bit of mainly just pr- uh, snippets and occasional movie rev- movie reviews twitter is just random thoughts a bit of sharing of other people's podcasts and then uh, snippets are released on there as well um, as well as a few other bits and pieces like mini reviews of movies uh, but then instagram is a lot more i try and post every day on instagram i don't usually uh, it's you know four or five times a week there's snippets from the chats there's images that often go along with them uh there's movie reviews there's things i get up to places i got to eat places i've gone traveling i'm getting a tattoo in late may as well so there'll be plenty of pictures of that too so you know if you want to keep up to date generally with genuine chit chat and you like hearing snippets and things like that instagram is the place that i post the most I think that's more or less it for me guys apart from the usual thing I say which is you know reviewing on iTunes that sort of thing is cool and I do appreciate that for anyone who even just you know go on iTunes click five star you don't even have to write anything that is really appreciated if you think it's worth five star that is um, but the thing that makes the most difference is sharing it with people you know and your friends you know uh, if you look through the back catalogue I'm sure you'll find at least one episode that you'll enjoy um, there's ones about religion there's ones about traveling there's ones about mental illness there's ones about photography people who are authors CEOs of companies weight loss and nutrition all kinds of different chats I've had with a wide variety of people um, a couple of weeks ago I chatted with someone from the Church of Satan Um, so that was interesting and only a week or so before that I chatted with the first legally blind director who's also written, acted in and edited a movie as well so lots of interesting people that I've spoken to so if there's anything in the uh, sort of back catalogue that you think is interesting, share with your friends share with people you think might be interested I don't expect everyone to be sort of a subscriber long term to this podcast it would be very nice if you subscribed and then if episodes pop up you're not interested in you don't have to download them but whatever you want to do no pressure at all and even if i tried to pressure you there's not really much i could do apart from begging at the end of this thing and uh, judging by the timings this outro is already far too long so i'm gonna cut it off there anyway guys as i say thanks as always for tuning in i really appreciate anyone listening especially this far and i'll talk to all of you next week also i hope all of you have a great mother's day (laughs) because that's the day i'm releasing this